hearts into. That's something to behold, ladies and gentlemen. We're really giving you the good stuff too. All the hosts on this network, every time I tune in, I'm just like, wow, they've got really good guests. And the host has got talent. That's how good American Freedom Radio is all the time. That's why you go to AmericanFreedomRadio.com and you start donating every month. Set up one of those little automatic payments to help them pay the bills and keep giving everybody, not just you who donates to us, the truth that they need. And we may even be starting to turn this into a bit of a television network as well. Hush, hush. My very special guest is Jim Willie, the Willie the Jackass. Welcome to the Vinnie Eastwood Show. Good to be on. Might you give us a little bit of background on yourself, who you are and what it is you do? By trade, I'm a statistical analyst. I have a PhD in probability and statistics. I started my career in 1980. I worked as a quality control analyst for manufacturing at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. At the same company, I did work as a marketing research analyst. That was a great deal of fun. From there, I went to Staples, a complete switch, and was a retail sales analyst and forecaster. And then I bounced around a little bit and decided to try a, a newsletter because I realized that I knew more about why gold was rising and why interest was accumulating in gold. And uh, I started writing. It became kind of popular, my work. I started a newsletter and it, it became rather successful quickly. And uh, so far, so good. That was April of 2004, so here I am 12 years later, and uh, the distinction that I have, Vinny, is my forecasts are sometimes a little unusual and sometimes a little early, but uh, they're about 80%, 85% correct. Wall Street analysts are in the 20% range. They're not paid to be correct. They're paid to promote a narrative, a position, a banking center strategy. So basically, about 20% of the time, their lies turn out to be true, you mean? <laughs> well, they can't be completely wrong because they, you know, have a functioning brain and they must write something. So you could call it accidental. You could also say that they got a few easy things right. Even if you shoot at somebody blindfolded, you might hit them. I tend to have unusual forecasts, like... Uh, Right after Lehman Brothers, I said there would be a U.S. government debt default. It would take several years, and I think we had it early this year. They're not about to tell you that they've had it. They're just going to have it and uh, deal with it all privately because China wants to get rid of all their treasury bonds or at least spend them or do something with them. The most unusual forecast I had, Vinny, was it was late 2011, and The Voice, who is a, a dear source and contact friend, who's a gold trader, an international gold trader, he told me, sorry, Jim, we're just not going to get that Banker Nuremberg trial. We're not going to get it. I thought we might when Lehman fell because of all the trillion-dollar crimes and genocide that's going on, you know, like Agenda 21 that you mentioned. So I immediately said, well, if we don't get a Nuremberg banker trial, we're going to see them murdered, are we not? And he said, yeah, we are, but it's going to be a little unusual. And we left it at that. I wrote him back and said, I think we're going to see a lot of mid-level bankers murdered. They know too much. They were assigned to do too much. They don't have sufficient power. They aren't made men. They're not vice presidents. They're not protected. And something even worse than I expected happened. Uh, a bunch of bank mid-level bankers were killed starting in 2013 and 14. It really accelerated in 2015. Many of them were J.P. Morgan related, and some of them were called suicides. But when a fellow in London was shot repeatedly by a nail gun at three meters, they did not try to use the suicide story. But they did use the suicide story in the one case where a guy was shot himself in the head six times with a nail gun <laughs> in both sides of his head. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he was just determined to die. You know, some you can't stop some people. Well, there was another incident in Belgium where someone related to the Swiss reinsurance sector 
was shot along with his wife by a motorcycle gunman out by the front of the house. They did not call that suicide either. All right, so the point I'm trying to make is that I make unorthodox calls, but I make a lot of regular calls. Like after Fukushima, I, I said that with all the emergency measures, it was going to be kind of a repeat to the Kobe earthquake from a long time ago. I can't, can't remember, 20 years ago, something like that. And I said, we're going to see a big drop in the Japanese yen. And we did. They just loosened controls too much. But I have a lot of a very standard type of forecasts. I, I think it was about a year, year and a half ago, I said the petrodollar is going to be dismantled and look for a, a, a great deal of disruption. And it could come in the derivative sector, which is a sector where you might have these very large, like $100 billion contracts linking the dollar with the crude oil price, linking the euro currency with the crude oil price. Right now, I think we're going to have a gradual flip of Germany toward the east, and it's going to be very slow. I made this forecast in the middle of 2014. I said a lot of things have to happen in order for the forecast to come true, and we're starting to see the elements now of an internal revolt within the German government structures. And it's being led, by and large, from the industrial captains of the German industrial sector, their economy. And now we're starting to see some evidence of that. I got an indication, Vinny, from a German client. He wrote me and said there are approximately 500 different contact points being made between German industry and Russian large corporations right now. Germany decided to ignore the Russian sanctions. So I think what's going to happen in the next few months is that the European Union and its commission are going to be largely ignored. Ignored for the sanctions, ignored for GMO food declarations on labeling, ignored for the transatlantic investment partnership, the trade union, yeah. the TTIP. And, you know, it really going to be a big invitation for countries to exit the euro, exit the European Union, maybe soon stop paying taxes to Brussels. That's where rubber hits the road. So that's a little bit about where I come from. I, I, I like to write. My father is a uh, retired literature well, professor. Ask? You've, you've got so you've got like a background in, in, in this field of being able to communicate at a very high level with very complex sets of data and you've chosen forecasting as the main thing that you do whereas other people would choose economic history or economic current affairs why did you choose forecasting specifically well i chose gold specifically i did a kind of a post-mortem after some damage to my own financial status in the year 2000. And the several months of study that I did led me to the conclusion that the problem is phony money. The problem is central bank power. The problem is enormous deficits, debt saturation. And what is really needed, I came to this conclusion in 2001, what we really need is a gold standard. We need to get off this fiat currency road. It's a false road. It has a bad ending. And I, I started writing about gold, Vinny. I, that was what I chose. I, I thought the solution's going to be gold, and the problem was that we got off the gold standard in 71. And it has deadly consequences. It means that there's no limit to creating money. There's no limit to permitting credit growth. And the consequences are pretty much a saturation, like filling your living room with water. Eventually, your head hits the ceiling and your couch is floating. There's no survival. I wrote more and more. The first article that I really think made a splash was 25 Reasons Why Gold Will Rise. And this was in response to some disgust that I had because I was reading things like, well, Gold is rising. This is 2003, remember? Gold is rising because of the Palestinian situation. Are you kidding me? Gold is rising because the interest rates are below the price inflation. We got negative real interest rates. That's why gold is rising. That was the fuse that started this gold revolt. The interest rates went down, down, down under Greenspan. He urged people to borrow money against their homes made it very easy for everybody to do that, but the easy money led to some price inflation, 
right away. And we always had price inflation. We always have three to five percent more price inflation than they admit. And the result was the interest rates were below the inflation rate. And that historically has been a fuse to light the gold switch, the gold dynamite. And here we are. It, it's even worse now. We've, we've got eight to 10 percent price inflation. And now we have 1.3 something percent on the 10 year bond for the U.S. Treasuries. By the way, about four or five months ago, I forecasted that the U.S. Treasuries would go down to 1.5 and then 1.3. Another correct forecast. Why are you able to make these uh, deductions? Is it the same reason why I'm really good with my deductions about political scumbaggery? It's just I have a look at the data. I know a bit about these people and how they kind of operate. And I just make an incredibly cynical guess. You know, the worst case scenario that I could really think of. And 90 percent of the time it turns out to be right. And about 10 percent of the time I'm glad I'm wrong. I don't think it's guesswork on your part. And it's certainly not guesswork on mine. My father makes a, a regular insult to me, and less so lately. He said, Jim, uh, what do you do? You, you, you use a crystal ball and come up with a forecast? I say, no, Dad. Let me explain to you one forecast. And I don't remember which one it was, but I mentioned four or five important factors. I said, this has already started to happen. And, and if the forecast turns out to be in the right direction, we should see confirmation in these two related areas. And when we get close to the final climax for the correct forecast, it's going to be very messy, but you'll see a lot of people climbing on board late who didn't see it early like I did. And my dad's response was, well, I, I heard what you said in those five minutes, but I have to admit that those concurrent factors, the simultaneous events and factors related, I don't really understand what they were. It's pretty hard, I concluded, to explain a correct forecast to someone who's ignorant. Hmm. I think you're absolutely correct, and I, and I find this myself when I'm when I'm talking to people who are ignorant, and you know, I'll, I'll explain concepts, etc. But the thing is, in order to explain the concept, hmm, it's it's very difficult to know where to start. It's as if if somebody makes an assertion, and the assertion is wrong, but it would require them several thousand dollars of an education and several years of personal study afterwards to even understand the answer that I gave them in the first place. It's a lost cause. I'll give you an example of, of a, a very interesting situation that displays ignorance so that when you make a statement even, not a forecast, a statement about the current situation, you find dizzy looks and glazed over eyes. I made a point about the artificial Fed rate hike in December. It was really not a rate hike. It was an adjustment of various reverse repo features and no confirmation from the effective Fed rate and no confirmation within Fed futures so I dug deep and found that the reverse repo was the goal. It wasn't a rate hike. What they wanted to do was make an adjustment to the reverse repo policy and induce the banks with what seemed to be a 25 basis point rate hike, induce them into cooperation because the goal was to use the reverse repo, take the big banks cash, give them U.S. treasuries, and allow them to leverage up on the treasuries in a way that they could not with cash. And I've explained this to a few people, and what I get back from them is, I have no idea what the reverse repo is. I really don't have any idea what you just said, but you sound pretty good and you sound confident about it. Vinny, how do you, how do you deal with that? You don't. You don't. You just tell people, well... Take my word for it. Who, who was it? There, there's a great line in, uh, in a film called Riddick, and they had these two different power cells, but a different ship that wouldn't fit it. And you go, well, why can't you just jig up the different cell to rig the ship? And he goes, well, I could give you a crash course in theoretical particle physics and acceleration of proton particles and explain why it wouldn't work, or you could just take my fucking word for it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, it gets down to that. But what you yeah. are essentially saying, I have this knack, or at least I like to think I do. It's called the gift of summation. 
Somebody can give me a five minutes of incredibly complex detail and I can tell it back to them in a couple of words without missing out any of those details. Occasionally it works. And essentially what I discerned from what you were telling me, I didn't understand what reverse repo was or, or any of that kind of stuff, but essentially what it sounded like is the banks are getting given a whole bunch of these things called treasury bonds, which are worth an infinite amount of money, but... You can only access that infinite amount of money if you've got them in your hands. You can't have them if the government's still got them. So you just buy those treasury bonds. And then, once you've got them, you can expand them infinitely into bullshit money. I think that's, that's you know, pretty much it. What I like to do is to explain it in the terms of a Tower of Babel. By doing reverse repo, they reduce the footprint of the tower, the foundation area, if you will. And with a narrower base, they are building a taller tower. It's more unstable. And derivatives don't like movement and instability and volatility. I like to say that the tower doesn't want to move left or right or back or front. It doesn't matter what the movement is. So when we had some big movement in May of 2012 and the London Whale became a household name, J.P. Morgan announced a huge derivative loss. I let it be known that the loss was between 10 and 100 times larger, and I identified their lie. They said that the European sovereign bonds made volatile movements. They made positive movements, but they did make movements. They said that there were big losses from the euro sovereign bonds, and that was a lie. And I looked around, and Rob Kirby and I, a Toronto-based bond analyst and bank analyst and expert in derivatives, he said to me, Jim, no, the target, the area, you can point the finger to the U.S. Treasury bonds. It went from 2.4% to 1.7% in that same period of time, that one quarter, where J.P. Morgan lost on derivatives. So it was volatility with European sovereign bonds. But it was big movements with the treasuries, and derivatives don't like big movements. It's like the wind pushing back and forth and left and right on that narrow tower of bobble. It's kind of funny. I explain some of these things to, to people I know and, you know, sometimes to newer clients. And I have conversations with, with people I meet in town, and I keep hearing the same thing. Well, I don't really know what this quantitative easing is that you mentioned from the Federal Reserve. I don't really know what central banks do. I don't know what derivatives are. And even though you explain a tower, that sounds all kind of neat. But I don't really know what the big Wall Street banks do with regards to treasuries. So you know what this reminds me of, it reminds me of a scene from, um, I think it was called Hot Fuzz, where they go out to see this guy, uh, but he's got a really, really bad accent kind of thing and nobody can really understand him. Except this one guy, who also has a really bad accent, who nobody can understand except one guy. So they do this circle where the guy with the really bad accent talks to the other guy with the really bad accent, who then talks to the other guy who can only just understand him, but nobody else can, and then he, like, blurts it out in English. That's what we need for economics, all right? Economic professor says, has <laughs> and then the uh, economic sub-professor, and so on and so forth, onto the comedian, you know, at, at the other end of the spectrum, who really simplifies it down and basically makes a joke out of it and uh, makes sense of it all at the same time. Well, I'm glad you said that. That makes a lot of sense because we used to have, remember, Fed speak with Alan Greenspan? No. And he would talk about liquidity and offloading risk to derivatives. And then Bernanke came in and we had the alphabet soup, all kinds of different uh, liquidity facilities. What the hell is a liquidity facility? Well, I'll tell you what it is. We have down at our local water reservoir one of those. Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's what liquidity facilities are good for. When all your big banks are insolvent, you better not let them get illiquid because they'll all go bust. So you better put in liquidity facilities so they don't all go bankrupt. 
liquidity. Um, I needed to explain this to people, actually. They don't know what it is. So let's say you've got an overdraft on your checking account and some kind of unexpected bill comes in and then you don't have any extra money in your account to pay your other bill that has to come in and then you get some kind of dishonor fee or whatever and then you get kicked out of your house and there's this whole bunch of extra bad consequences as a result of just not having that extra 20 bucks. Enter the uh, extra liquidity account, right? All it does is give you the extra that you need right there to make sure you don't get kicked out of your house and then you quickly pay it back or at least that's supposed to be what it is so that the economy can breathe underwater as it were. I think you got it right. I get that a lot. Now, somebody told me that the Brexit vote is some kind of ruse and it's going to lead up to the breakup of the EU and that the EU is going to morph into something even worse, right? And I'm thinking, that sounds really far-fetched and incredibly terrible. It's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> That's how economics in the globalized world seems to work, I think. I think you have it right. I think there might be some more agenda behind the Brexit vote. I think they made a miscalculation, and now they're trying to capitalize on a situation that they've lost control a little bit. But as they lost control of England, they may be tightening their control of the European Union. And as that happens and they try to tighten the control, they're going to lose their member nations. It just reminds me of one time I was trying to drink a water out of the palm of my hand. And I remember this analogy about it's like you're trying to hold the water as tight as you can, but the, the tighter you clench your fist, the more water squeezes through your fingers. And that's what it's like trying to hold control over other people, I think. Yeah, let, let me give, try this example. It just came to mind, Vinny. And it's not something I have prepared, but you realize my woman doesn't love me as much as I thought she does. She's doing things that don't display that kind of love that I thought was there. And there's an argument. So you try to hug her more. You try to say, let's do more things together, honey. And she's thinking, I'd like a little more freedom. I'm not looking for a divorce, but I'll see you later tonight if I feel like it and she doesn't come back. The next day, you try a little more desperation and you hold her hand and she doesn't like that. You put your arm around her shoulders while walking down the street and she says, what are you doing, honey? Why are you acting this way? And before you know it, you're trying to hold her and she's trying to resist you. That's what I think is going on. It's like the European Union had an affair with England. And that bitch bolted. That's what I think is going on. And this is going to get a lot weirder. But w what do you think about that? You know, you, are you saying that Great Britain is doing some kind of walk of shame? I think Great Britain is doing an FU. The Federated Union. The European Union, whose uh, head, interestingly, was Herman von Rompuy. I've got this whole thing labeled out, geopolitics and uh, how the New World Order take over stuff. How do you eat an elephant? A little bit at a time, they say. Eh, they start off with the European Economic Community. Oh, that sounds really nice. It sounds like a trade deal, first of all. And then in comes all of these little legislative reforms under the guise of trade. And uh, guess what's happening now globally with TTIP, the TPPA as well, tying in New Zealand, the whole world. They're turning us into globalized super blocks at the same time as the first super block that the New World Order created is kind of like teetering on the edge. And it's a really risky move. I've been watching these people for eight years and I've maybe understood their intentions fully for, for about maybe two years. And I've never seen them act this way. I've never seen them push such massive agendas simultaneously. They're either really ballsy and they think they can get away with it, or they're really freaking desperate and they think that they're about to get overthrown because all the little revolutions, they sort of boil away for a really long time and nobody even knows that they're there. 
and then all of a sudden they just boil over and just spill over everything and change the whole world. There's some people who, who think that that's about on the horizon and frankly those people need to remember that the most important thing to think about during times like that is what you're going to do after the revolution is over. What kind of society you want, what kind of economy you want, what sort of rules you're going to be governed by because if it all turns up to chaos and anarchy, guess who really thrives off that and will end up in power again scumbaggery that's her i tend to agree with that entire interpretation and perspective let me try to explain what i think brexit might have been since when does britain take orders from anybody they're not going to take orders from brussels anymore so this was a declaration of sovereign power by Britain. They're not going to fall under the wing of Brussels. Secondly, they might not have appreciated that Britain wants to do financial deals with China and commercial deals with Russia. So they don't want to go through Brussels and they're not going to anymore. And I don't care whether it's final yet. They're going to make deals now. Notice what happened at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum just two weeks ago. There were about 50 different billion dollar magnitude deals cut with Russia, every single one of them in violation of the sanctions. This is my point about the European Union being ignored. As they make more power moves, they're going to be ignored further. As they make more rules and regulations, they're going to be ignored further. They're actually doing some really stupid things right now. They're talking about expanding the European Union to the Middle East. What, adopting Arab nations? What the hell is that? Well, they do have a huge Arab population in the EU. I don't care. So, I don't care. Oh, I know. The craziness of it. I'm just wondering exactly, is there an agenda to turn the entire world into a global super state under the rule of the bankers, mostly, where we're pretty much uh, so subdued in either infighting or some other kind of divide and conquer tactic that every culture will just be some kind of homogenous soup and little by little, everything that everyone that lives on the earth today defines themselves or their country as one exists. There's something called the Morgenthau Plan. This is really ugly stuff. I believe after World War II, there was the Marshall Plan, there were various different things, there was creation of the Israeli state, there were a lot of different agendas being worked. And one of them was called the Morgenthau Plan. And one of its features is bring in what I call Arab human garbage and mix it in with your society to dumb down your population, make it more docile, make it more dumb, and there you've got your labor force. And they're not going to rise up against the elite because they can't figure things out. And since when do the Arabs ever organize together? There's another very big factor with the British exit. It's a rebellion against NATO. There are two fascist entities in Europe now. One is clearly the European Union Commission, the EU Commission. But the second fascist power is the NATO Supreme Commander Office. Because after the Ukraine war began in February of 2014, we're two years plus into this, the NATO Supreme Commander started issuing orders and bringing into his office the member nation prime ministers and presidents to include their security staff and follow these orders. And the member nations were just befuddled that Brussels and now the NATO commander from the Pentagon is giving them orders and they're losing their sovereignty. The British just happened to be the first nation to say, fuck you, we're not doing it anymore. And in addition, you cannot leave out that the British we're saying no more on the human Arab garbage influx. Just a reminder of another unusual forecast that I made. It was made in August of last year, and I had been asking the question after watching, you know, the boatload of the refugees, and they're not refugees, they're emigres, they're desired immigrants. Some of them are well-dressed. 
They have cell phones and laptop computers, and they instantly do research and look for the northern nations of Europe because they have a better welfare state. But I ask the question, if these people are supposedly poor and they're refugees, who's paying for their passage? And we saw pictures of overloaded, desperate people on ships, and we saw pictures of floating bodies of people who didn't make it on the Italian and Greek shores. And I found the answer to the question, Vinny. It was the George Soros NGO, non-government organizations, that were paying millions of dollars for free passage. And I said, okay, well, if that's the case, this is going to be cover for an influx of a lot of violent people. This is like a continental version of the Cuban Marielle boat people onto the shores of Florida where violence increased. And here was my forecast. This is, remember, August of 2015. I said a major Western European city was going to have a big terrorist murder incident. A big murder event. And there it was, Paris, France. Yep. Another unusual forecast. And remember a key detail to this event. A Mexican woman named Jimenez called home to Mexico City, told her parents, I witnessed a violent incident. I'm okay. I am in police custody. And she was found murdered. So, you know, that's just another kind of unusual forecast. That incident was also quite interesting, if and, uh, there were people murdered in the office building. And there's a puddle of blood. The person was supposedly murdered on her office chair at her desk, right? And there was a puddle of blood on the floor, and the chair was on top of the blood, completely clean, right? Impossible. And... It just occurs to me that people aren't as bad as you think. Even though George Soros like gets in all these violent criminals and everything like that into there, some of them may be real scum, right? real bad people, right? But they still don't stage terror attacks all on their own. They have to be recruited and patsied into it and so on and so forth. And even nine times out of ten, they still can't get the job done, so you've got to get your local police and intelligence operatives and people who have plausible deniability to do it and then execute them all afterwards so that you can continue to have plausible deniability. And you can also ramp up the police state and restrict everybody's freedoms as a result of the incident that you yourself pulled off to get the measures that you wanted in the first place anyway through Parliament. Exactly. In fact, just to, to add to my little Paris-France terror incident story, they removed one week before an expensive carpet in a certain theatre. <laughs> Hey, you know, we need to get this carpet out of here, man. You know what, man? Then there was the Brussels terror incident, which was about a month ago. And I looked into that and made some quick conclusions after learning some things. It was done at the airport. Well, who had the airport security contract? The Mossad. So an incident took place on their watch. So the conclusion is one of two things. Either they're very incompetent or they're totally responsible. Well, they do call them Mossad for a reason. They aren't there to make you more happy. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I call them the mass wipes. Yeah, that's that's actually quite clever. Thank you very much. I approve. All right. Well, you know, th this this British exit is, is very important, and now I'm looking to see what is going to happen with other member states. I think we're going to see a lot of movement toward breaking away and setting up their own referendum with Denmark, with the Netherlands. And Germany's going to have an interesting movement because right now Merkel is actually saying you can't have a referendum in Germany because our constitution doesn't permit it. Watch it happen anyway, and they'll just rephrase it to be something else, like we don't want to follow their directives rather than we want to break out of the union. <laughs> In other words, you know, we're going to divorce ourselves, but we're going to still be part of the household. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be very weird. But I think there was a miscalculation. Cameron lobbied toward the vote a year ago when he thought it would not pass. And he miscalculated. So he resigned. And now we, we basically have no power structure at all at the top. 
in England and London. I like to say the only power structure there is the head of City of London in the financial center. It's kind of like a financial mayor, if you will. Like a mayor Rothschild. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, but but more like really the the the, the uh, what's the word? A chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce and the head. Okay, so they miscalculated. What I think scared the bejesus out of the British was the new ties that the Chinese have been making with European financial centers, in particular Zurich, Switzerland, and Frankfurt, Germany. They're setting up RMB trading hubs there as to do bond issuance and to do RMB currency trading. That's not the only place they've got it. They, they've got an RMB hub in, in Paris, France. These are small, but Frankfurt's going to be big. And I think London got scared that the continent might offer them competition in ways that they never have before. So instead of working through Brussels, they decided, let's rebel against Brussels, tell them to go to hell, and work out our own Chinese deals for the RMB Center in London. And, and they've already issued in London some sovereign bonds for the Spanish government debt. And by that, I mean Spain called up London, said, sell some bonds, the fee structures in place for your profit to your brokers. The denomination of the bond for Spanish government debt will be Chinese RMB currency. Let it fly. And they did. I think it was a $3 billion worth of bonds in RMB. This is the sort of thing the British did not want to lose to Frankfurt and Zurich. And now look for some LNG, natural gas deals, with Russia and Gazprom. They don't have to abide by the sanctions. And I don't give a rat's ass, I like to say, I don't give a backward flying turd about sanctions. They're going to do what they think is right for their country. And the British are going to cut deals with the Russians. Okay. Now, I've also got the thought about a, a big power play here because of the sort of precipitous nature of this. It's a genuine collapse of a major section of banking here, like the uh, European Central Banks and the Bank of International Settlements and, th and things of this nature. They've got a lot of debt invested in this EU, which they've been using essentially as something to bludgeon these, <laughs> these poor countries into doing what they want, stealing all their national resources and assets and infrastructure, etc., and uh, palming it off to Serco, you know, taking over the prisons here in New Zealand as well, or uh, Veolia. These big, giant firms that handle massive amounts of private contracting. And the international bankers have figured out that if they own all the private contracting firms, as well as issue the base accountancy and credit of countries, and it's even better if they're all collectively getting their issuance and currency controlled by these criminal central banks in the first place, because then it just makes the whole game much faster and easier. You don't have to do the whole thing over again. You can just smash the whole bag of eggs in one go. Can't you? Because then they get you in debt, they then seize all your assets and seize them with the private contracting companies that they own. I mean, why, why do people think that 84 people control 60% of the world's wealth right now? It's not rocket science. They're stealing it. It's a fraud. That's the reason why the financial industry interests me so much, because it confuses me. And I found during my journalism days, any time I'm hearing somebody in a position of official capacity saying something that I don't understand, it means that they're involved in fraud or they're describing some kind of fraud that's going on. Well, let's point to one of the biggest frauds in a century. Following the Lehman Brothers event, you could call it a failure, but it was also a murder crime scene. J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs suffocated them by refusing to pay on their asset sales. Wow, unbelievable. So what happened was the owners of the Federal Reserve issued themselves in two tranches $23 trillion worth of loans at near 0%. I guarantee you they'll never pay them back. When I heard that, I concluded they're going to scuttle the world economy and these owners of the Fed 
are going to buy up $23 trillion worth of assets from crumbling economy and the fractured situation. And I don't know if it's happening right now. They don't tell us what they do. We don't know who's buying up the big European banks or the big European steel companies or the, the big refineries. We don't know. We don't know anything about what they do. It's a big club. All I know is that if I'm sitting down at a poker table and I've got like maybe a couple of thousand dollars in chips and the guy across from me has got maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars in chips, it's going to be very easy for him to get the rest of the chips on the table from everybody else. Well, especially when he controls the rules and he controls the PA system in the room. And pumps pheromones into the room to make you more docile and willing to spend your money. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about the press networks and the regulatory bodies, the regulators, they control that. So it was kind of like the gold market. Oops, the price is going up. They're going to increase the margins and force the price back down. Change the rules midstream to favor the people who have the most chips. It's a rigged game, but they're losing it now. Isn't that like the definition of like the worst incompetence that you could ever conceivably imagine, that you could lose your own rigged game? You know? <laughs> so, uh, now, sometimes it's like schadenfreude, you know, interesting that we're talking about Germany and the EU, you know, it's, it's funny and enjoyable to watch someone stumble so badly. But I do wonder sometimes, and I hear this commentary from so many people, all oh, these people are so stupid, they're so stupid. In some cases, no, they're not stupid at all. What they've done, if they were doing it unintentionally, would certainly stu equal stupidity. But... It's more the fact that it's evil to a large degree. I mean, am I, am I wrong here? Or is there a large quantity of just really, really evil people who are the decision makers in our world today? I think they're very evil. They're Satanists. They're being outed as Satanists. And Putin is a main propagator of the information that's outing them as Satanists. They're not doing stupid things. They're doing bold power grabs that to a logical person appear stupid. And they're now in a desperate mode, Vinny. I was told by The Voice about a year and a half ago. It was right around Christmas 2014, the turn of the year, early 2015. He said, Jim, the elite are on the run. They're on the defensive, and there's this white dragon society directive. You know, actually, let's spend the uh, the next hour on that, the uh, the white dragon society and the elite being on the run. Uh, that sounds like a really good hour to spend, because so rare is it when we talk about economics and politics and uh, doing so in the alternative sphere that we actually have some good news, something to embolden us, something to make us want to fight another day. You're listening to The Vinnie Eastwood Show. Go and donate to the com. That's Vinny with a Y because it's the most important question. And Eastwood, like, go ahead, make my news. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of the fastest two hours in talk radio. It's the Vinnie Eastwood Show on AmericanFreedomRadio.com a couple of nights a week for the listening discomfort of those people who don't like to learn anything. <clears throat> you know, not that they'd be listening anyway. Now, here's another thing. I have so many different guests on this show talking about so many different topics that I'm starting to question my beliefs on about a monthly basis now. All right? And ladies and gentlemen, believe me, it's a really good thing for your personal growth to stop learning on occasion and just take some time out to digest what it is you have seen. What it is that you now think you know. There's so many people out there who keep reading the articles, keep listening to these new shows, and you know, more radio, more YouTube videos, more this, that, and the other. You're consuming, you're feeding yourself into this kind of thing, but there's no outlet, all right? You are essentially intellectually constipated. That's what's happening now. You haven't had enough interaction with other people. You haven't shared your knowledge with them, these new things that you've discovered. You haven't fully understood what it is that you think you know yet. 
and you're very stressed out about it and you're very angry with other people a lot of the time and you start calling them names and you start getting hot under the collar whenever people start arguing with you. You know what that's a sign of? It's a sign that you're right, they're wrong, and you haven't figured out a way to be at peace with that. Be at peace with the fact that the world is full of idiots. Be at peace with the fact that it is run by scum. Don't accept it, but understand that it is, regardless of how you feel about it, the way it is. And try to live your life happy while you resist them. Because who wants to get exterminated with a frown on their face? All right, now seriously, go to thevinnieeastwoodshow.com and start donating $2.50 a week today on that homepage there. You need about 40 people to do that, and that puts us over the threshold for our budget for survival for this month and every month subsequent after that, ladies and gentlemen. So if you're one of those people who can spare $2.50 a week for this little enterprise, please go to the com and do that today. Now, we have no FCC regulations on this broadcast on American Freedom Radio, thankfully, so we can say whatever the F we want and whatever we fucking want to. And my very special guest is Jim Welliver Jackass. Welcome to the show. Again. Well, it's good to be here. You talked about intellectual constipation, and I jotted down a few things, and here it goes. We're dealing with a day and age and society overloaded with intellectual constipation, suffering from debt saturation, economic sclerosis, and extreme political apathy. This is how the elite, the Satanists, are trying to bring about their global fascist state. But they've got a bit of an overreach, and it's just not working. A very positive event took place about three years ago. Senator Jay Rockefeller of West Virginia retired. Unfortunately, he didn't get retired in the uh, replicant uh, sense of the word, uh, because uh, unfortunately, Rockefellers, they just don't seem to die, right? It, how many heart transplants has David Rockefeller had? He's had like eight heart transplants, right? And they've carved open like eight small boys to keep that guy's heart running. Right. It's unbelievable. <laughs> like, grass dies when he walks on it. He's so evil. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. But the good news was this. Jay Rockefeller had a pet project to pull in the Internet under federal communication control, and he failed. And I think he resigned because he failed. He said, I give up. This is my assignment from the elite. This is my reason for being in the Senate for the United States government. And the Federal Communications Commission just could not be brought to heel and control the Internet. And there's something remarkable about, about the Internet that, that I just love. It's technology moving quickly, and government moves slowly. So when the government decides we want to do this or that regarding the Internet, they, they start arguing about it, they draft a bill, they get a sponsor, it, it gets some progress, and by the time it gets to the Senate floor or the House floor, it's obsolete. <laughs> That's just wonderful. I, I just laugh every time I... I, 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 I think of this concept. But uh, anyway, before we went on the break, I was talking about the... Uh, the White Dragon Society and the elite being on the run. The elite being on the run. And this is very real. If you don't know what the White Dragon Society is, then just check into it. You know, it, it's not a pure organization without a bit of nasty history. You don't find any billionaire's club on earth without some nasty, smeary history. The way I understood the White Dragon Hat Society or whatever is basically if the Illuminati were Asian instead of European and they were Buddhists instead of Satanists. That doesn't differ much from my concept. Bring in – okay, since you mentioned the Buddhists – Yes, Buddhists instead of Satanist, so they're not bent on destroying the world and bringing hell on earth, and they're not interested in dominating all the money 
and defrauding and making everybody poor. And by the way, I want to put a caveat on that and say that it's not the fake New Age uh, Satanist hijacked Buddhism of the do nothing to stop evil and uh, just be happy and everything will be uh, uh, roses and sunshine. Yeah, that's that's a bunch of crap. Yeah. Google Mark Passio New Age bullshit, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to spend a couple of hours of your life, maybe even seven hours of your life, sitting there going, yes, yes, I'm not the only one who thinks this, yes. Yes, I'm not the only one who thinks this, you know, and actually have reasons for why you hate the things that you hate. It, it, it's, it's very self-justifying for me for watching that thing. But anyway, I digress. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> what I was told was just think of the beginning of 2015. There had been a lot of progress regarding a directive. Just think of it as the Eastern Directive. And its target was the Western elite. The Western elite had their directive of the New World Order. In other words, a global fascist state emanating from the Western world. The Eastern directive was very much in conflict with that and still is. It's about global harmony. It's about taking good care of the earth rather than destroying it with, say, chemtrails and GMO foods, and fracking of the water system, and lacing the vaccines, and using harp to create earthquakes and tsunamis. The East has rebelled against the Western agenda to wreck the Earth. The East has rebelled against the Western agenda to commit bond fraud, monetary fraud, and all kinds of economic fraud toward impoverishing the world. Just look what's happened to the household wealth in terms of home equity. It used to be the cornerstone of individuals' financial security, and it's gone. It's gone almost, almost across the entire Western world. Now, don't worry about Asia. Just worry about, say, Europe, Australia, and uh, North America. Home equity has been wrecked. And now in Australia and New Zealand, you're seeing a good deal of Chinese colonization coming in and overbidding on your property. Okay, that's my little digression. <clears throat> the Chinese and the White Dragon Society have moved in and made demands, nasty demands with threats to the Western elites. And what I've heard is that in early 2015, 90% of the entire hierarchy of the Western elite families had signed on and conformed to the Eastern Directive regarding Earth integrity and banking and monetary security and integrity as well. I'm talking about the Rockefeller, Bush, and Rothschild families. These are the three principal Satanist groups in the Western world. You know, just to show you how disgusting and hypocritical these people are. When George Bush Jr., that's what I call little Bush, baby Bush. Pardon me, my throat. <clears throat> my throat is bothering the heck out of me. <clears throat> you poor bastard. See, and uh, also, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I, want, I wanted to... Uh, note as well, and and thank you, Tim, for for coming on anyway, because I was fully prepared to just like rant straight solo for like two hours today and let you go get some rest and everything like that. But no, 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 no. Even though you you feel nauseous and you've vomited and 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 all all of this other kind of stuff, you're still here. I'm 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 just like any 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 minute now. <laughs> any minute yeah, now, he's gonna. Need you didn't need to mention the vomit there, Vinny. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That, I, it's just <clears throat> I have this thing where I where I just think, you know, that's so embarrassing. I just have to make it public. You know, just just, just uh, to, to make everything uh, real, right? <clears throat> okay, it's we, real. I want to be real with people, and and, and that's the thing. We're, we're real people. We're not some kind of scumbag. You know, like I'm wearing pajama pants. Okay, there you go, right there. I don't yeah, even got, wear proper got... pants. I got sweatpants on, and uh, I'm very comfortable. My feet are up. Okay, regarding these families, a little side story. W, you know, baby Bush, 
In order to win the election in 2000 for the U.S. presidency, he decided that he was going to sit on Sunday mornings in a Protestant church during services. And that way, he could capture the Christian vote if he just let it be known that he was against abortion. I know Christians. They fell for it. They all fell for it. And I said, this guy's not Christian. What are you talking about? It's probably more Satanist than Christian. And they said, well, I don't think so. He doesn't like abortion. And that's a very Christian attitude. All right. That's, there's a saying in Alcoholics Anonymous that I learned when I was very much involved in, with them for five years back in the late 80s. I was a marijuana addict, and they allowed me into the Alcoholics Anonymous family. And I'm, I've been clean and sober for 28 years. Yeah, that's another little real fact of a real person who vomited. Fine. Okay, <clears throat> here's the little saying they have. Just because a couch is sitting in the garage doesn't make it a car. Just because baby Bush sat during Protestant Sunday service in the church didn't make him a Christian. Okay, back to the directive, the Eastern directive. Ben Fulford has promoted this story a bit. And, uh, you know, he's an interesting cat. I don't believe all he says. I tend to believe more than 50% of what he says. He's got a lot of pretty zany details, but that's okay. You know, my real problem with Ben is that all the things that I think, you know, man, Ben, that sounds a little bit crazy. Usually a couple of years later, they turn out to be true. So now it's like, it's only after a couple of years, maybe I've done three interviews with him that I realize like how to actually handle him and how to, and how to take his information. You take it like something out of left field that just happens to be true that your belief system isn't currently able to accept because of your, the way that you've been grown up and been brainwashed in many other different ways upon your normal average life that you live in a society full of brainwashed scumbaggery and, and uh, nutrient dense <coughs> nothingness. Uh, mate, it's just unbelievable the things that people can say that turn out to be true. That's all I'm saying. But, yeah. I, I get that a lot with my forecasts. And I say, well, get back to me in a year when, when some of the things start falling into place. It's not so much that your belief system is out of whack. It's that you see absolutely no evidence toward that. And I, I got that comment back in 2013 when I said the petrodollar was going to die. I got that attitude in 2014 when I said Germany was going to flip east. I get that a lot. I, I got that in post Lehman when I said the U.S. government debt was going to default. And I said, well, just give it some time. And then I, I, some people would say, Jim, you know, it looks like the U.S. government debt default was put off by QE and the Fed's quantitative easing and hypermonetary inflation. I said, yeah, exactly. Exactly. They couldn't find a buyer for a trillion dollars worth of debt per year to securitize the U.S. government deficits. So they printed money to cover it and they called it stimulus. It's not stimulus. It's debt default avoidance. And I said, OK, now you're starting to see that the government debt default for the U.S. is a lock. And they say, yeah, I see it now. And now we're starting to see cracks in the U.S. Treasury bond foundation. We're starting to see derivatives. We're going to see some derivative explosions soon, and I think they're going to emanate out of Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank is an interesting entity, and they're, they're kind of like Europe's headquarters for bank derivatives, and they're also at the same time an outsourced Wall Street derivative center. They were also the bank that was used to make bets against American airlines during 9-11. It's a very dirty bank. They've got a lot of dirty Russian money that flows through it. And some of the, the killings, they call them the, the banker suicides, some of the killings were done by the Russian mafia. Okay, there's a saying that the voice, the voice is a very wise man. 
and he's very alert and he's clever and he's he's a cool guy with his use of English and the phrases. He said, if the murder was clean for that banker, it was done by the Vatican. If the murder was really sloppy, they didn't care. It was done by the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got a saying actually just like that. I remember one time I came home and my wife said, Vinny, there was a truck bomb that was averted in Times Square. And without knowing anything about it, I just go, oh, don't worry about it, baby. It was probably just an FBI staging thing. And it turned out later that it was. And uh, my philosophy is, is that when there's staged terror attacks, generally speaking, the FBI will stage them, but the CIA will actually pull them off if they do get pulled off kind of thing. There'll be CIA involvement, but... Right, the, all the, the different little robot people. The robot people hear voices, like the fellow who shot Ronald Reagan. Two months into his presidency, after choosing Papa Bush as his vice president against his will. Right. Right. Did you know that Jack Ruby, who shot Lee Harvey Oswald, had a landlord named George Bush in Houston. I mean, this is so interconnected. You go on and on. So yeah, you, you talk about the FBI arranging it and the Langley folks pulling it off with all their, what I call, robot. That brings me to one more point that occurred to me before the show today, is that intelligence agencies were originally created by the elites and the royals back in the day, hundreds of years ago, so that they could spy on each other, do all sorts of really down, dastardly stuff that if they were caught doing it or people that were associated with them were caught doing it, they'd be in big trouble. But if they got private people to do it for them, it's no problem at all. And it turns out that about 75% of the funding for the NSA and the CIA come from private interests. I don't know about the funding, but I do know about some of the dollar value for the narcotics that come out of Afghanistan. It's between 800 and $1,200 billion a year. Mm, it's a lot of good black ops money, I would say, especially if you're a private cartel. Yeah, well, they had some directors of the CIA about 40 years ago who put out their own justification that I prefer to call rationalization, that in order to keep America safe, they needed to fund the black bag, black projects. They needed to keep America safe by selling heroin. I, I never bought the argument, never bought it at all, never got involved with any narcotics personally. I just got in trouble with marijuana. Yeah. Now, back onto the White Dragon Society and the elite, because I fear that we've gone on on many tangents here. That Have you noticed that tangents are like tree branches, right? No matter how far they keep growing, they keep splitting and they keep growing in different directions. But, yeah, let's nip that at the bud, shall we? Do we have any positive news on this kind of thing? Because we're oh, talking about the elite being on the run, you know? Whenever I get an email from a client or a follower... I, I've got probably 10 times as many followers or maybe 100 times as many followers as I have clients. Clients are people who pay me. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> I tell them, when they say to me, isn't just the White Dragon a different criminal society, a different elite organization, and it's headquartered in the East, and they're just going to take over where the Western elite left off, and it's just going to be a change of the guard, but the same old, same old. I said, no, it's not. They do not like destruction of the earth. They do not like the bond fraud. They do not like fraudulent money. They prefer to do lots and lots of earth integrity cleanup. And the voice says they have a name. It's called the gardeners. And they have a big budget. And they're going to start plying their trade soon. The white dragons in the east have a high priority for the gold standard. Well, I got news for anybody who's naive enough to think that it's just the same old, same old with a change of guard. The gold standard puts the elite in the West out of business. So the biggest positive that you can point to has to do with the earth, the money, and the gold standard. Bond fraud is going to stop. Counterfeit is going to stop. And what I would like to see is not for the Basel 
gold solution to take place, but instead the Chinese and white dragon gold solution to take root. I don't want the same people who gave us bond fraud and currency illegitimacy to be in charge of legitimizing a gold solution. I don't trust them at all. I want the East to do it, and I want the West to follow their lead instead of trying to have a parallel lead. The white dragons have apparently threatened a lot of the elite in the West. And again, it's Rockefeller, Bush, and Rothschild. And all the Clintons fall under, you know, it's kind of funny. Bill Clinton has a father, and his name was Winthrop Rockefeller. You take a look and do a Google search of Winthrop Rockefeller, you see a face that looks a bit like Bill Clinton. You look at his bio and you see Arkansas, where Bill came from. You look at the role, the career of Winthrop Rockefeller, and you see that he was governor of Arkansas in the 70s. So in the 70s, or maybe in the 60s, he had a baby with his wife. Okay, that's about right for the age of Bill Clinton. It fits like a glove. But Bill Clinton decided to take the dark side and to work closely with the Bush family. The Bush and Clintons are the main proprietors of the Association for Past Presidents Fund, which is an investment vehicle for their narcotics money. So Bill Clinton is kind of a hybrid. He's a Rockefeller, but he's in the Bush family. Those three families are now really under siege. A lot of the underlings have converted and signed over their allegiance and conformity to the White Dragon's directive for earth integrity, stopping the bank fraud, and imposition of a gold standard. And when these things come about, Vinny, you're going to see a remarkable renaissance in the global economy and, and capitalist structures. When you said those, those objectives together, I was like, holy shit. Yes. yes. Can you imagine all the positive trickle down from, say, cleaning up the earth? The positive trickle down from capital investment having to do with the Eurasian trade zone? The Eurasian trade zone is going to be the avenue for this directive. It's going to be the joining of the old Soviet republics, the Asian economies, the BRICS nations, and a whole lot more. It's going to bring in all the 117 BRICS alliance nations. And this entire Ukraine war is to block the Eastern directives, not just the Eastern white dragons. It's to block the marriage, that the union of Russia with the European Union. The Rothschilds did not want Russia to join up in any kind of economic union with Europe. And there's a reason. The Rothschilds hate Russia, and Russia hates the Rothschilds because the grandfather to the current Rothschild arranged to set up the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, arranged to borrow the Tsar's gold, like 15,000 tons, and then arranged to murder the Romanovs and to install Lenin as the ideologue along with Marx, and I guess Trotsky had a role. So the Soviet Union, Vinny, was a gold heist. Not unlike 9-11, allegedly. <laughs> where, yeah. you know, supposedly a whole bunch of gold that was in the bottom of the World Trade Center wasn't found afterwards, after all the dust and everything had settled, you know? But there were reports of giant flatbeds and things like that coming in and out of the World Trade Center with covered loads a day before, and, you know, it just... <sighs> Reminds me of Fort Knox when Congressman Ron Paul asked to see if, if there was still gold there in it and he was refused permission. It reminds me of the Bruce Willis movie, Hard to Kill 2. You mean uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance? The star villain was Jeremy Irons, and they shipped out several trucks load of stolen Federal Reserve gold, and it was a giveaway of 9-11. The voice tells me that 9-11 involved the theft of $100 billion worth of gold bullion. 
but also $100 billion worth of bearer bonds. And also Cato, my military U.S. government source, told me it was $100 billion worth of diamonds. So $300 billion gold height. Here's one of the funniest facts that I know regarding ignorance of Americans and, and maybe a lot more than just Americans. I asked them, what was the biggest bank in 2001? What was the biggest private bank in the world? And they say, I don't know. And I tell them, the World Trade Center. And they say, I didn't even know it had a bank. The largest bank in the world, most people didn't even know the location had a bank. 9-11 was a bank heist, Vinny. But it also was the ticket for installing the U.S. fascist state. Oh, you know what they needed? They needed to steal some seed capital so that they'd have the funding to set up all the military arms and the militarization of the police and have a huge slush fund so they could actually fund the setup of their new world order, enough to bribe officials in every country to pass their subsequent new world order legislation like Agenda 21, Codex Alimentarius, that kind of thing. It's like, dudes, let's just go for it. One big bank heist and we'll have enough capital so that we can set up a new world order and make it run forever. I don't disagree one iota. Not one iota. In fact, I think they, they are using narcotics and buying off governments and central banks with narcotics, you know, cuts for the narco money laundering. Many, many countries. And it, what it does is it gives a payoff, an income stream to the heads of the banks, the heads of the government for lots of little countries and mid-sized countries. And that way, they don't have to dip into their fund that they stole from the World Trade Center. That's $300 billion. They don't have to dip in if they use narco money laundering cuts. A small percentage goes. Uh, which is convenient because they used 9-11 to justify invading Afghanistan, which at that time had the Taliban, which not only didn't want a Unical pipeline, but they also didn't want heroin. And at the time, we're only producing 1% of the world's heroin. But luckily, Osama bin Laden, or Tim Osman, who was also recruited by the CIA during the 80s to fight the Russians, was there. And so they invaded and made a former Unical advisor, Hamid Karzai, the prime minister, and then the next year it started producing about 90% of the world's heroin and increasing the percentage of the supply ever since and allied forces you know I like to use the term loosely including New Zealand soldiers have been photographed guarding these poppy fields and the manufacture of heroin aided by CIA contractors and all this kind of stuff as well so you know that's how you do it isn't it? Yes, it is. That's how you do it. And there are a lot of little details that are worth never mentioning, like details having to do with Kosovo, or other details in NATO bases for distribution bases for the heroin. I try to leave it all alone. There's a woman named Catherine Austin Fitz. She revealed the Bush and Clinton theft of $1.6 trillion. $1,600 billion dollars of Fannie Mae fraud. She uncovered that and she survived three assassination attempts through arsenic poisoning. Her mother was murdered. Her mother was an economist in the Arthur Burns Central Bank regime for the Federal Reserve in the 70s. Her mother was murdered. And her mother's pet project was the Bush narcotics money laundering scheme, and she tracked the money and listed the banks in Panama, etc., and tried to make more public the trafficking for the money behind the Bush family, and she was murdered, murdered on her front lawn. Okay, this, this is what they do to people who get too close. And I had two death threats, Vinny, in 2006 when I was offering – not details of 9-11 and how they did it, but details of what I call the Nazi playbook. And I just came up with that name myself. You know, the false flag attack. What the Germans did was they attacked their own Bundestag, their Congress, blamed it on one certain group, declared that there was an invisible army for that group, just like the Islamic terrorists, you know. And I made the parallel on five different points, displaying what the... Nazi playbook was 
and how it applied to the 9-11 incident, and I immediately got a death threat. No need for the details of the threat, but uh, I said, okay, you know, that's the way you want to play. I, I hear you. I'll leave it alone. Then I got a second death threat when I was at a conference in Germany, and that was face-to-face. And it was so bold that it took place in front of three of my own clients. My own paying clients at the conference were there to, to meet me and talk. And while we were walking around, I got interrupted by a fellow who I believe worked for U.S. Homeland Security and the United Nations. The United Nations is a very scummy organization. They're the world's biggest uh, human trafficking front as far as I've found out. Yeah, <clears throat> don't doubt it at all. And the Chinese realize this, and they're making their own. There's a second United Nations under construction right now, and I think it's Beijing. So the White Dragons I, I've described as having a very positive agenda for the Earth integrity, for banks, and for the monetary system, the gold standard. The gold standard puts the elite out of business. Okay, the voice has said many things to me in the last few years. Some of the things that have stuck with me the most are comments like, Jim, are you aware that when China leads the effort and the Eurasian trade zone adopts gold as currency and gold trade notes are used for trade payments, are you aware that when the gold standard is imposed that trillions in elite wealth are wiped out? And I said, I can imagine it. I just don't know exactly how it's going to happen. And he said, well, I'll, I'll help fill in the blanks as we go. And unfortunately, lately, he's, he's on an assignment in a project that I think has got just really high security clearance. And he's let it be known that he's going to be unavailable for a little while. I think he's working on the reset, Vinny. I think he's working on details like for connecting, say, the gold market that he's very familiar with, connecting it with the chips, the Chinese interbank payment system that's a competitor to SWIFT, the bank transaction system. I think he's working on the reset, connecting gold with the Forex market and gold with the banking system. And it's not simple. The Chinese have a problem. They don't have all their platforms ready. They don't have all the SWIFT alternative and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. They don't have it fully funded. They don't have a lot of momentum yet with the projects. They're having some problems now with Brazil, which is a key Latin American anchor to the BRICS and would have been an important piece to the Eurasian trade zone. They've got a lot of uh, trade going on with Russia now in the food market where the Europeans got dropped off. The South Americans picked up not just Brazil, but Chile and Peru and Argentina. They're very big trade going on now in the food sector regarding Russia. But uh, there was a big fiber optic cable system that was going to be an alternative to the Western Internet. That might not be quite so quickly implemented. That was to go through Brazil. And I think the funding for that has been somewhat interrupted or delayed. Or they decided maybe it's not time yet. I don't know. They didn't consult with me. They didn't fill me in with a briefing. But anytime you hear about Eurasian trade zone, anytime you hear about White Dragon, anytime you hear about Eastern efforts toward, toward the gold standard, think of it as putting out of business the Western elite putting out of business the entire Rothschild Central Bank franchise system. Vinny, I'd like to share with you something that I've heard. It's very difficult to confirm these things, but I'd like to share with you something that I've learned regarding the gold pricing and the gold standard coming into view. It has to do with international contracts. You're probably aware, and so are probably a lot of your followers, that international contracts on a bilateral and multilateral basis, and by, by that I mean like between Bolivia and China, they're priced in dollars. And the commodity market, which is a big, big multilateral agreement setup, they price in dollars the commodities, like buying copper, buying aluminum from Russia. It's paid in dollars. So you've got complex contracts all across the world and the contracts are written in dollars because the dollar is the global reserve currency, but it's also the trade settlement currency because it's 
the world reserve currency. The problem is that the U.S. economy is abusing the dollar with credit. Ship your goods to the U.S. economy and we'll give you toilet paper that are called treasury bills and payment. The world doesn't like it anymore. That's a problem. There's another problem. The U.S. government cannot finance its debt with either domestic or foreign investors to buy the bonds. So the Federal Reserve abused the dollar by printing it to cover the U.S. government debt. The world doesn't like it. So there's a problem that the U.S. economy and its government together, both trade deficit and government deficit, have a big problem. They cannot finance themselves properly, and the world is telling the United States we can't have the dollar as the global reserve currency anymore. We can't have the dollar as the medium for global bilateral and multilateral and commodity trading settlement. We can't have the dollar for trade payment settlement because you're abusing the dollar in your home country for trade and your government deficit. So here's the challenge, Vidi. They've got to change, and this is what they're working on. Who are they? It's the Chinese financial officials together with the White Dragons and their representatives. They're currently meeting with the Basel, Switzerland Bank for International Settlements and their officials. So in the east, they represent the Eurasian trade zone. They represent the Asian monsters monster economies, the superpowers. They represent the gold standard advocates. And who does Basel, Switzerland and the BIS, the Bank for International Settlement, who do they represent? All the Western central banks. And what are they talking about? They're trying to negotiate and they're making progress, I hear. They're negotiating a reform, a treaty to change all international contracts to change the dollar payment system into a gold payment system in order to liberate the dollar on the home front in the United States, which will enable the U.S. government with the Department of Treasury to launch a separate domestic only dollar. I've been calling this the Scheiss dollar because it's going to resemble a third world currency with its $500 billion trade deficit per year. Now, here's the climax point. If they make a conversion for international contracts to change from the dollar to gold, they need a value of gold in dollar terms, and they're working in the $5,000 range, which is over three times the current gold dollar price. We're talking about a sudden dislocation, as I've been warning, of a tripling or more of the gold price. The words declaration of war come to mind, like when Japan had oil embargoes and hemp embargoes and things like that. That's the real reason the U.S. invaded the Philippines, because to get the hemp, because they needed that rope. And uh, George H.W. Bush actually survived because of that uh, that hemp, because his parachute was named out of it when he got shot down in World War Two. But anyway, anyway, I digress. Taking that onto the gold standard, that's a declaration of war, I think, considered by the elite. Just like when Gaddafi said, OK, we want to set up an African currency and trade things with the gold dinar. Boom! Smacked instantly. Whole thing got destroyed. ISIS gets set up by the CIA. Whole bunch of weapons get come in. The whole country gets thrown over. Boom, destroyed. However, you can't freaking do that with a country like China. You can't do that with somebody who's so well connected and so powerful that any move you make against them, they can make moves back just as nastily. So this represents a credible threat to the establishment. And the fact is they're insane psychopaths and Satanists who I believe, when pushed to that very limit, would rather destroy the earth rather than let anybody else have it. That's what I'm afraid of.
Well, that's a legitimate fear, Lenny. And the whole Ukraine war was a move by the Rothschild to stop this Eurasian trade union from having the gold standard. They wanted to cut off the Gazprom energy pipeline to Western Europe from Russia. If they had the Eurasian trade union and it joined with Europe through Germany, etc., they would impose the gold standard and wipe out the Rothschild kingdom. This is precisely what you're referring to. The Rothschilds tried to have a nuclear war with Russia. It didn't work. There have been several, many nukes exploded in Ukraine. Many, probably 10 or 20. The Rothschilds tried to have a war with Russia. It didn't work. And Russia displayed their extraterrestrial technology to demonstrate to the United States military that they're not superior, that they don't have full spectrum dominance, like Cheney, the old vice president, used to call it. The U.S. does not have dominance anymore militarily. And, and now you have a show of strength that the Russians are putting out an aircraft carrier on the Syrian coast. The Russians are giving away certain codes for movements and flight patterns over the Baltics, Baltic nations, in order to avoid war there. The Russians are defusing the Western's attempt for a world war dictated and ordered and mandated by the Rothschild. This is your fear, but it's being interrupted. And now we're having negotiations between the White Dragons and the heads of the Rothschild family. We're coming to a climax toward a global treaty, a peace treaty, a positive treaty. And the Rothschilds don't like it. They, they want hell on earth. They love all the different fiery explosions. This is how they worship Satan. It's a blood sacrifice ritual. If blood is spilled on the earth whilst the person whose blood is being spilled wears a symbol a symbol of worship to your God, it counts as a blood sacrifice. Now, the star and uh, various other symbols, um, there's that three-pointed little thing, that's, that's, the, that's the demon tail, and you find that all the militaries of the, uh, the Western Hemisphere have one or more of these symbols on their uniform, and in their dark, sick way, I'm not saying this is what I believe, I'm saying this is what they believe, <laughs> in their dark, sick way, they think that causing chaos and death and murder and destruction and fear creates a negative energy pulse that allows more, shall we say, shady entities to cross into our plane or the ones that are already here become even more powerful and they think that they'll be rewarded for this. Yeah, you put it very well. I like to point to their fiery incidents and their April events. Two years ago, I did something interesting just to deploy some of my probability background. But I, I laid out a lot of different incidents, and there were something like a dozen or more incidents that involved fiery explosions and things like that, and they took place in April. And I said, well, what's the likelihood? And I'm just going to lay it out in rough terms. Like, I don't have the exact numbers at all. What's the likelihood that you would have, say, 10 events? that would all happen, there'd be big events, and they'd all happen in mid-April. Okay, so I said I wrote more and more. The first article that I really think made a splash was 25 Reasons Why Gold Will Rise. And this was in response to some disgust that I had because I was reading things like, well, gold is rising. This is 2003, remember? Gold is rising because of the Palestinian situation. Are you kidding me? Gold is rising because the interest rates are below the price inflation. We got negative real interest rates. That's why gold is rising. That was the fuse that started this gold revolt. The interest rates went down, down, down under Greenspan. He urged people to borrow money against their homes, made it very easy for everybody to do that. But the easy money led to some price inflation right away and we always had price inflation we always have three to five percent more price inflation than they admit and the result was the interest rates were below the inflation rate 
And that historically has been a fuse to light the gold switch, the gold dynamite. And here we are. It, it's even worse now. We've, we've got 8 to 10 percent price inflation. And now we have 1.3 something percent on the 10 year bond for the U.S. Treasuries. By the way, about four or five months ago, I forecasted that the U.S. Treasuries would go down to 1.5 and then 1.3. Another correct forecast. Why are you able to make these uh, deductions? Is it the same reason why I'm really good with my deductions about political scumbaggery? It's just I have a look at the data. I know a bit about these people and how they kind of operate. And I just make an incredibly cynical guess. You know, the worst case scenario that I could really think of. And 90 percent of the time it turns out to be right. And about 10 percent of the time I'm glad I'm wrong. I don't think it's guesswork on your part. And it's certainly not guesswork on mine. My father makes a, a regular insult to me, and less so lately. He said, Jim, uh, what do you do? You, you, you use a crystal ball and come up with a forecast? I say, no, Dad. Let me explain to you one forecast. And I don't remember which one it was, but I mentioned four or five important factors. I said, this has already started to happen. And, and if the forecast turns out to be in the right direction, we should see confirmation in these two related areas. And when we get close to the final climax for the correct forecast, it's going to be very messy, but you'll see a lot of people climbing on board late who didn't see it early like I did. And my dad's response was, well, I, I heard what you said in those five minutes, but I have to admit that those concurrent factors, the simultaneous events and factors related, I don't really understand what they were. It's pretty hard, I concluded, to explain a correct forecast to someone who's ignorant. Hmm. I think you're absolutely correct, and I, and I find this myself when I'm when I'm talking to people who are ignorant, and you know, I'll, I'll explain concepts, etc. But the thing is, in order to explain the concept, hmm, it's it's very difficult to know where to start. It's as if if somebody makes an assertion, and the assertion is wrong, but it would require them several thousand dollars of an education and several years of personal study afterwards to even understand the answer that I gave them in the first place. It's a lost cause. I'll give you an example of, of a, a very interesting situation that displays ignorance so that when you make a statement even, not a forecast, a statement about the current situation, you find dizzy looks and glazed over eyes. I made a point about the artificial Fed rate hike in December. It was really not a rate hike. It was an adjustment of various reverse repo features and no confirmation from the effective Fed rate and no confirmation within Fed futures so I dug deep and found that the reverse repo was the goal. It wasn't a rate hike. What they wanted to do was make an adjustment to the reverse repo policy and induce the banks with what seemed to be a 25 basis point rate. The stand except one guy. So they do the circle where the guy with the really bad accent talks to the other guy with the really bad accent, who then talks to the other guy who can only just understand him, but nobody else can. And then he like blurts it out in English. That's what we need for economics, all right? Economic professor says, has <laughs> and then the uh, economic sub-professor and so on and so forth, onto the comedian, you know, at, at the other end of the spectrum, who really simplifies it down and basically makes a joke out of it and uh, makes sense of it all at the same time. Well, I'm glad you said that. That makes a lot of sense because we used to have, remember Fed speak with Alan Greenspan? no. And he would talk about liquidity and offloading risk to derivatives. And then Bernanke came in and we had the alphabet soup, all kinds of different uh, liquidity facilities. What the hell is a liquidity facility? Well, I'll tell you what it is. We have down at our local water reservoir one of those. Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's what liquidity facilities are good for. When all your big banks are insolvent, you better not let them get illiquid because they'll all go bust. So you better put in liquidity facilities so they don't all go bankrupt. Liquidity, um, I needed to explain this to people actually. They don't know what it is. So let's say you've got an overdraft on your checking account and some kind of unexpected bill comes in 
and then you don't have any extra money in your account to pay your other bill that has to come in and then you get some kind of dishonor fee or whatever and then you get kicked out of your house and there's this whole bunch of extra bad consequences as a result of just not having that extra 20 bucks. Enter the uh, extra liquidity account, right? All it does is give you the extra that you need right there to make sure you don't get kicked out of your house and then you quickly pay it back. Or at least that's supposed to be what it is so that the economy can breathe underwater, as it were. I think you got it right. I get that a lot. Now, somebody told me that the Brexit vote is some kind of ruse and it's going to lead up to the breakup of the EU and that the EU is going to morph into something even worse, right? And I'm thinking, this sounds really far-fetched and incredibly terrible. It's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> That's how economics in the globalized world seems to work, I think. I think you have it right. I think there might be some more agenda behind the Brexit vote. I think they made a miscalculation, and now they're trying to capitalize on a situation that they've lost control a little bit. But as they lost control of England, they may be tightening their control of the European Union. And as that happens and they try to tighten the control, they're going to lose their member nations. It just reminds me of one time I was trying to drink a water out of the palm of my hand. Now, I remember this analogy about it's like you're trying to hold the water as tight as you can, but the, the tighter you clench your fist, the more water squeezes through your fingers. And that's what it's like trying to hold control over other people, I think. Yeah, let, let me give, try this example. It just came to mind, Vinny, and it's not something I have prepared, but you realize my woman doesn't love me as much as I thought she does. She's doing things that don't display that kind of love that I thought was there. And there's an argument. So you try to hug her more. You try to say, let's do more things together, honey. And she's thinking, I'd like a little more freedom. I'm not looking for a divorce, but I'll see you later tonight if I feel like it and she doesn't come back. The next day, you try a little more desperation and you hold her hand and she doesn't like that. You put your arm around her shoulders while walking down the street and she says, what are you doing, honey? Why are you acting this way? And before you know it, you're trying to hold her and she's trying to resist you. That's what I think is going on. It's like the European Union had an affair with England, and that bitch bolted. That's what I think is going on. And this is going to get a lot weirder. But w what do you think about that? You know, you, are you saying that Great Britain is doing some kind of walk of shame? I think Great Britain is doing... An FU. The Federated Union. The European Union, who's a uh, head interested. And so that's something to behold, ladies and gentlemen. We're really giving you the good stuff, too. All the hosts on this network, every time I tune in, I'm just like, wow, they've got really good guests. And the host has got talent. That's how good American Freedom Radio is all the time. That's why you go to AmericanFreedomRadio.com and you start donating every month set up one of those little automatic payments to help them pay the bills and keep giving everybody not just you who donates to us the truth that they need and we may even be starting to turn this into a bit of a television network as well hush hush my very special guest is jim willie the willie the jackass welcome to the vinnie eastwood show good to be on might you give us a little bit of background on yourself who you are and what it is you do by trade, I'm a statistical analyst. I have a PhD in probability and statistics. I started my career in 1980. I worked as a quality control analyst for manufacturing at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. At the same company, I did work as a marketing research analyst. That was a great deal of fun. From there, I went to Staples, a complete switch and was a retail sales analyst and forecaster. And then I bounced around a little bit and decided to try a, a newsletter because I realized that I knew more about why gold was rising and why interest was accumulating in gold. And uh, I started writing. It became kind of popular, my work. I started a newsletter and it became rather successful quickly and so far so good. 
That was April of 2004, so here I am 12 years later, and uh, the distinction that I have, Vinny, is my forecasts are sometimes a little unusual and sometimes a little early, but uh, they're about 80%, 85% correct. Wall Street analysts are in the 20% range. They're not paid to be correct. They're paid to promote a narrative, a position, a banking center strategy. So basically, about 20% of the time, their lies turn out to be true, you mean? <laughs> well, they can't be completely wrong because they you know, have a functioning brain and they must write something. So you could call it accidental. You could also say that they got a few easy things right. Even if you shoot at somebody blindfolded, you might hit them. I tend to have unusual forecasts. Like uh, right after Lehman Brothers, I said there would be a U.S. government debt default. It would take several years, and I think we had it early this year. They're not about to tell you that they've had it. They're just going to have it and uh, deal with it all privately because China wants to get rid of all their treasury bonds or at least spend them or do something with them. The most unusual forecast I had, Vinny, was it was late 2011, and The Voice, who is a, a dear source and contact friend who's a gold trader, an international gold trader, he told me, sorry, Jim, we're just not going to get that Banker Nuremberg trial. We're not going to get it. I thought we might. When Lehman fell, because of all the trillion-dollar crimes and genocide that's going on, you know, like Agenda 21 that you mentioned. So I immediately said, well, if we don't get a Nuremberg banker trial, we're going to see them murdered, are we not? And he said, yeah, we are, but it's going to be a little unusual. And we left it at that. I wrote him back and said, I think we're going to see a lot of mid-level bankers murdered. They know too much. They were assigned to do too much. They don't have sufficient power. They aren't made men. They're not vice presidents. They're not protected. And something even worse than I expected happened. Uh, a bunch of bank, mid-level bankers were killed starting in 2013 and 14. It really accelerated in 2015. Many of them were J.P. Morgan related, and some of them were called suicides. But when a fellow in London was shot repeatedly by a nail gun at three meters, they did not try to use the suicide street hike, induce them into cooperation because the goal was to use the reverse repo, take the big banks cash, give them U.S. treasuries and allow them to leverage up on the treasuries in a way that they could not with cash. And I've explained this to a few people. And what I get back from them is, I have no idea what the reverse repo is. I really don't have any idea what you just said. But you sound pretty good and you sound confident about it. Benny, how do, you, how do you deal with that? You don't. You don't. You just tell people, well, take my word for it. Who, who was it? There was a great line in, uh, in a film called Riddick, and they had these two different power cells, but a different ship that wouldn't fit it. And you go, well, why can't you just jig up the different cell to rig the ship? And he goes, well... I could give you a crash course in theoretical particle physics and acceleration of proton particles and explain why it wouldn't work, or you could just take my fucking word for it. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, it gets down to that. But what you yeah. are essentially saying, I have this knack, or at least I like to think I do. It's called the gift of summation. Somebody can give me a five minutes of incredibly complex detail and I can tell it back to them in a couple of words without missing out any of those details. Occasionally it works. And essentially what I discerned from what you were telling me, I didn't understand what reverse repo was or, or any of that kind of stuff, but essentially what it sounded like is the banks are getting given a whole bunch of these things called treasury bonds, which are worth an infinite amount of money, but you can only access that infinite amount of money if you've got them in your hands. You can't have them if the government's still got them. So you just buy those treasury bonds, and then, once you've got them, you can expand them infinitely into bullshit money. I think that's, that's you know, pretty much it. What I like to do is to explain it in the terms of a Tower of Babel. By doing reverse repo, they reduce the footprint of the tower, the foundation area, if you will. And with a narrower base, they are building a taller tower. It's more unstable. And derivatives don't like movement and instability and volatility. I like to say that the tower doesn't 
want to move left or right or back or front. It doesn't matter what the movement is. So when we had some big movement in May of 2012 and the London whale became a household name, J.P. Morgan announced a huge derivative loss. I let it be known that the loss was between 10 and 100 times larger and I identified their lie. They said that the European sovereign bonds made volatile movements. They made positive movements, but they did make movements. They said that there were big losses from the euro sovereign bonds, and that was a lie. And I looked around, and Rob Kirby and I, a Toronto-based bond analyst and bank analyst and expert in derivatives, he said to me, Jim, no, the target, the area, you can point the finger to the U.S. Treasury bonds. It went from 2.4% to 1.7% in that same period of time, that one quarter, where J.P. Morgan lost on derivatives. So it was volatility with European sovereign bonds, but it was big movements with the treasuries. And derivatives don't like big movements. It's like the wind pushing back and forth and left and right on that narrow tower of bobble. It's kind of funny. I explain some of these things to, to people I know and, you know, sometimes to newer clients and I have conversations with with people I meet in town and I keep hearing the same thing well I don't really know what this quantitative easing is that you mentioned from the Federal Reserve I don't really know what central banks do I don't know what derivatives are and even though you explain a tower that sounds all kind of neat but I don't really know what the big Wall Street banks do with regards to treasuries so you know what this reminds me of it reminds me of a scene from, um, I think it was called Hot Fuzz, where they go out to see this guy, uh, but he's got a really, really bad accent kind of thing, and nobody can really understand him, except this one guy who also has a really bad accent, who nobody can understand. But they did use the suicide story in the one case where a guy was shot himself in the head six times with a nail gun, <laughs> in both sides of his head. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was just determined to die. You know, some you can't stop some people. Well, there was another incident in Belgium where someone related to the Swiss reinsurance sector was shot along with his wife by a motorcycle gunman out by the front of the house. They did not call that suicide either. All right, so the point I'm trying to make is that I make unorthodox calls, but I make a lot of regular calls. Like after Fukushima, I, I said that with all the emergency measures, it was going to be kind of a repeat to the Kobe earthquake from a long time ago. I can't, can't remember, 20 years ago, something like that. And I said, we're going to see a big drop in the Japanese yen. And we did. They just loosened controls too much. But I have a lot of a very standard type of forecasts. I, I think it was about a year, year and a half ago, I said the petrodollar is going to be dismantled and look for a, a, a great deal of disruption. And it could come in the derivative sector, which is a sector where you might have these very large, like $100 billion contracts linking the dollar with the crude oil price, linking the euro currency with the crude oil price. Right now, I think we're going to have a gradual flip of Germany toward the east, and it's going to be very slow. I made this forecast in the middle of 2014. I said a lot of things have to happen in order for the forecast to come true, and we're starting to see the elements now of an internal revolt within the German government structures. And it's being led, by and large, from the industrial captains of the German industrial sector, their economy. And now we're starting to see some evidence of that. I got an indication, Vinny, from a German client. He wrote me and said there are approximately 500 different contact points being made between German industry and Russian large corporations right now. Germany decided to ignore the Russian sanctions. So I think what's going to happen in the next few months is that the European Union and its commission are going to be largely ignored. Ignored for the sanctions, ignored for GMO food declarations on labeling, ignored for the transatlantic investment partnership, the trade union, yeah. the TTIP. And, you know, it really going to be a big invitation for countries to exit the euro, exit the European Union, maybe soon stop paying taxes to Brussels. 
that's where rubber hits the road. So that's a little bit about where I come from. I, I, I like to write. My father is a uh, retired literature well, can I, can professor. You've, you've got, so you've got like a background in, in, in this field of being able to communicate at a very high level with very complex sets of data. And you've chosen forecasting as the main thing that you do, whereas other people would choose economic history or economic current affairs. Why did you choose forecasting specifically? Well, I chose gold specifically. I did a kind of a post-mortem after some damage to my own financial status in the year 2000. And the several months of study that I did led me to the conclusion that the problem is phony money. The problem is central bank power. The problem is enormous deficits, debt saturation. And what is really needed, I came to this conclusion in 2001, what we really need is a gold standard. We need to get off this fiat currency road. It's a false road. It has a bad ending. And I, I started writing about gold, Vinny. I, that was what I chose. I, I thought the solution's going to be gold, and the problem was that we got off the gold standard in 71. And it has deadly consequences. It means that there's no limit to creating money. There's no limit to permitting credit growth. And the consequences are pretty much a saturation like filling your living room with water. Eventually, your head hits the ceiling and your couch is floating. There's no survival. 